the Freedom Convoy. I was actually shocked that it happened. I thought when it was announced, um, nobody would show up. And I know this is old news. Why are you bringing up old news? Mostly because I don't want people searching it and finding it on YouTube. This is for you, my friends, and the, 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 the five people who watch this. Um, but this is this. I would rather not the, the greater population see this and comment on it. But I was surprised when it was organized. I was shocked to death that they actually organized and they, they came to Ottawa and other places and they stayed as long as they did. That's not really a Canadian thing. Canadians don't do that. We're socially conscious and kind of lazy. That's... I know that, that if you're Canadian, you'll immediately disagree with me because you have to fucking shovel snow in the middle of winter. You're constantly exerting yourself. But if there's something you don't agree with, you don't like, you might complain about it to your friends, to your neighbors, to your co-workers. But to actually organize and go somewhere and protest, it's not really a Canadian thing. Some people do, and there have there have been some, um, you know, pretty impressive hiccups, pretty impressive protests in Canada. But it's not like the United States, and it's certainly not like France, who seems to to pro protest every other day. But as a result, maybe as a result, but. Uh, uh, seemingly as a result of our our predisposition we also don't enforce a hell of a lot you may not know this if you live in Ontario you may not know this but for the past about four years the um, trades uh, laws you know the things that uh, that uh, govern um, like uh, like if you're elect uh, a licensed electrician, a licensed plumber, all that kind of stuff. If you're doing uh, commercial work or um, you are advertising to do work in in residential, like if you're if you're representing yourself as a as a tradesperson, all of those laws have not been enforced for the past four years. In January is when they seemingly started to become enforced again. And it went completely unnoticed for four years, perhaps longer. I'm, I'm, uh, I think it was 2018, but it might be as far back as 2016. But whenever, certainly after Doug Ford got in, not a single person was fined for being on a job site, posing as a tradesperson without a license. Not a single person. They said that they shifted from enforcement to education. They probably weren't doing anything at all. They probably fired all of their inspectors or put them on leave or something. But for that entire time, unqualified people could be hired, put in a building, and be installing your electrical outlets. If you're living in a house that's been built in the past four years, especially if it's like a, one of those cookie cutter houses that you find in, in new developments off, off to the side of a city, it is very likely that somebody without a license did something in that house. And inspections never occur. Um, when I was an apprentice plumber, ins the inspectors came out for new buildings and things like that. But mostly it just amounted to the guy looking around, nodding his head and leaving. And if you own your own home or you are a, um, you're a corporation that owns a building or several buildings, 
the law says that if you do anything more than changing a light bulb, you have to get a permit. And all the time you have homeowners and landlords putting on extensions, gutting um, uh, apartments, tearing down walls, putting in all the new electrical systems, even screwing with foundation. And they never get a permit. And there's no enforcement. Most municipalities actually have laws on the books that say that unless you live at a certain address, you're not allowed complaining about that address. Now, of course, that's regulatory negligence. But no one ever calls those municipalities on it. Larger municipalities like Ottawa and Toronto, they can't get away with that stuff because you have, you know, around a million people living in your city. A lot of those people are going to sue if they're angry at you. But if you're in a small town with 5,000 people, 10,000, 15, 20,000 people, nothing happens. None of that shit is enforced. There are cities, towns really, in Ontario where the parking uh, laws aren't followed. That they're in violation of Ontario and Canadian um, highway standards. And no one forces them to comply. Now, I had some difficulty with my municipality several years ago and I tried to get it worked on. I tried to get it done. Um, the only thing I could really do was contact the ombudsman because the um, the municipality refused to, you know, comply with its own laws. It refused to enforce its own laws. And then the ombudsman came around and said, we will look into this for you. We will contact them. And it took several months. And then afterwards I get a call from them and it says, we're going to do this. And it said, well, that's not enough. And mostly it was like, we're going to suggest this and we're going to suggest this. And then finally they said, well, we have no power of enforcement. We can only make suggestions. We can't make them do anything. So what's the point of the ombudsman then? Nothing. The Ministry of um, Municipalities and whatever the second part of that, that title is. Again, no enforcement. There are some towns that have no bylaws. And if there are no bylaws, then there is um, a branch of government under the uh, Ministry of Municipalities that can help you. But if they do have bylaws, even if they're contrary to um, provincial or federal bylaws, they can't do anything about it. Now, you could probably sue. You could probably get into a, into a court and, and be ruled in your favor, but you need that money. A couple years ago, I tried to open a business, okay? Um, internet um, resale. Internet resale hadn't caught on yet. There was just the big names. And it took off like a shot um, after I got the hell out of it. But I got screwed over by one of my suppliers and I tried to go to the CRTC to file a complaint. Now, big businesses, the wholesalers were protected and customers were protected. But I wasn't because there was a gray area in the laws dating back from cable companies that basically said that if you were reselling, you had no protection whatsoever. And that's basically what the law said. It was one law drafted in the 70s that was still in effect in 2015 or something like that. And after that occurred, I, I closed down my business because I had lost you know, quite a bit of money um, from that endeavor. And the fact that this company wasn't, you know, um, uh, fulfilling its contractual obligations was nuts. So I contacted a lawyer and they're like, 
Oh, you can absolutely get the law changed. This is, you know, this is, this this is not this law is not modern enough, and um, um, you can sue successfully. It'll take a few months and fifty thousand dollars. And my dispute was for like six thousand bucks, so I'm going to spend fifty thousand dollars, and this this dispute wouldn't be with the company that screwed me. I couldn't get my money back from him at all. This was solely with the CRTC and the $50,000 would only be to modernize the law, to force them to modernize the law. You can also ask the music industry um, how well uh, RCMP enforces uh, copyright law. They don't. In fact, they've gone out of their way to say that they will not investigate um, copyright claims. Period. Full stop. I was a defendant. I don't think I was named. They were trying to get my name. Um, in a case, uh, basically the company that, uh, that holds the copyright for Hurt Locker um, whoever the hell those people are, went after Tech Savvy to get the name of something like 500 uh, users to be able to be sued in court. And that was, oh God, 2010, something like that. You can look it up. And nothing, nothing's ever come of it. Like, I don't know if it's bogged down in the court systems or if the if the uh, if the um, the complainant dropped its case or what. It just sort of disappeared. They they notified me like five or eight years after the case started because they were they were just ordered to give the names, give up the names, and they were refusing for some reason. There are so many instances of Canadian authorities just not doing their job. Giving a warning and walking away. So when the Freedom Convoy was sitting down there in downtown Ottawa, blowing their horns 24-7, and the cops just sort of stood around. That didn't surprise me in the least. If you have a domestic disturbance in Ontario, um, there is a law that the cops can remove you if they have a reasonable suspicion that something went down. They can't really arrest you unless you are, um, they believe that you've committed a crime and, um, you know, there's something specific they can charge you with. But they can basically make you do a timeout, take you out of the home, keep you separated for a few minutes, things like that. As far as I can tell, it's that power has never been used. They suggest it. Um, I was a victim of uh, domestic abuse when I was in my teens. And that's basically what happened. The cops came, two cops came, and nothing happened. They just left after a few minutes. Now, of course, I wasn't saying anything and the other person was being a dick and being confrontational but because it was two girls I guess maybe they didn't want to do anything about it I really don't know but you can go to any um, abuse shelter and they will tell you the same things cops don't intervene and it's not the matter it's not a matter of well, we can't do anything until he or she hits you. 
It's just a matter of them doing nothing. Of them saying, you know, take a few minutes to calm down. It's a lot of, quote-unquote, education. Same thing, we'll go back to the, um, uh, to bylaws. Same thing with those. If a landlord or a homeowner is in blatant violation of the bylaws, they're almost never fined. It's just education. They inform them of the laws. Ignorance of the law is a massive excuse up here. Even if it should be blatantly obvious that the law has to be followed. You know, just taking something off the top of my head while looking out my window. A person with a tin roof, where the roof has, has partially rotted away, and the tin is flapping back and forth in the wind. Ready to come off and hit somebody, or go through somebody else's window. Which is the more likely thing. Ten complaints, and nobody ever does anything. A friend of mine lived in um, a house converted into an apartment out here in the, the boondockles. Um, and he was living in basically a shithole. There were so many violations, it was unconscionable. The bylaw officer was there dozens of times, not just for him. There was, a, there was a neighbor with two kids that liked to get into trouble. Two teenagers that just, you know, wouldn't fucking behave. But eventually, family services got involved because somebody else had moved in with a young kid. And I guess her boyfriend or her husband or the, 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 the baby's daddy, whatever, um, didn't like how the kid was living. And child services got involved and forced the city and the fire department to get involved. Because there was fire code violations in there that the bylaw officer never mentioned, never saw. So you might immediately say, well, the truckers were protesting. And Canada has a history of crushing protests. Yes, but what kind of protests are recurring? Usually they're not protests against the government. Protests against the government, the government does nothing. Um, it's when those protests disrupt a corporation. Like all of those anti-pipeline protests where the RCMP came in and cracked skulls. That wasn't really the government deciding to do something. That was the corporation getting on the government's nerves to do something. There have been sit-ins, usually by First Nation, that have lasted years. I think there's there's one, uh, there's a a, um, a spiritual sit-in or a, a I don't know what they call it, but they, they've been basically uh, protesting something to do with the federal government, this First Nations tribe, for 60 years. And there is somebody that they always have involved. And the government just never responded to it. That's the thing with the Canadian government. The Canadian government is selective enforcement. In the United States... If you keep pushing, you will eventually find a, find a judge that will enforce a law. Some of them won't. Some of them will say that it's so minor that they don't want to prosecute or something. But eventually, it will be enforced. And it will be enforced down to the letter. They really like that down there. Enforcing things down to the letter. That's changing. In the United States, it's changing. 
that they're that they're starting to um, dismiss a lot of cases based on it being outside of their scope. That wasn't always the case. In the U.S., they love to sue. They love to get things done. Canada, not so much. So it was ripe for this type of abuse. And it will happen again. Mark my words. Now that whoever was behind these protests knows that this that it can do it in this way it will occur again there will be another protest where they'll go to downtown Ottawa and they'll sit around they'll be disruptive they'll chant or whatever but as long as it's not in semis the government will probably do nothing if every single day they people drive to um, Parliament Hill and they park legally and they all gather around the eternal flame and stand on the lawns and chant and hold signs every single day not disrupting traffic the government will let them sit there forever because that's what Canadians do as long as it's only mildly irritating we do nothing. We are non-confrontational. We're very non-confrontational people. Uh, the people who are suing in uh, downtown in the Glebe, that's a small neighborhood downtown. Very nice neighborhood that I wish I lived in. Well, not during that time period, but I wish I lived in it now. Uh, I think it what, took them two weeks? Two and a half weeks? Three weeks before they, they filed an injunction ensued because that's just how Canadians are we we're just non-confrontational we try to ignore things like people not being licensed working on construction sites that's a real thing it really is. Go look it up. Google it. It's a real thing. As of this January, they might be enforcing again, but seriously. Electricians, um, plumbers, HVAC, all of those people, they were educating, quote-unquote, instead of enforcing. Not a single ticket um, had been issued since like 2017, 2016, something like that, because of Doug Ford. People are constantly driving while texting or taking phone calls. Distracted driving is constant in Canada. Nothing happens. Speeding is constant and ever-present. Nothing happens. If the posted speed limit is 80, you can do 90 and you will not be pulled over so why doesn't it say 90 well because if it said 90 people would do 100 that's sort of the unwritten rule it's not in the books absolutely not in the books but generally you can go 10 kilometers over the speed limit and no one's gonna say a word you will not get a ticket more than likely not get a ticket this isn't legal advice but I have never gotten a ticket, even when I drove commercial vehicles. No other commercial vehicle driver has ever gotten a ticket doing 90. 95? Yes. One of the drivers was doing 95 in an 80 zone and got a ticket. But never got a ticket at 90. Ever. And he'd been, he'd been working in the industry for 30 years. And this will be Canada's downfall, is non-enforcement. Non Just the lackadaisical attitude of, well, it's not that bad. 
You can kill a person with paper cuts. You cut a person enough times, you can kill them with paper cuts. They will bleed to death or get an infection so horrific. What's that green flashing over there? So horrific. That they die a, a painful, meaningless death. I think I want to go for that. I'm going to try going for those green lights. See what they are. And what can you do about it? Generally, nothing. You can't force them to enforce the law. It's defeating. It really is. When you... I don't... I think that was just a reflection of light something. Yeah, see? I can see green down there again. Maybe... No. Yeah, I see little flashes of green over there. I think that might be the... Uh, the... The... The street lights. And, uh... It's just, uh... Giving the wrong RBG value. Like, usually I have this big, long, hour speech rant or something that I talk about, but... This time, not really. That's... that's it. If you want to be fairly certain that as a business or a landlord or whatever you want to do, you want to be fairly certain uh, that you will get away with not following discrimination laws, um, not paying your people properly, and I don't mean under minimum wage, I mean, you know, like, no overtime, too many hours, shit like that. Come to Canada. It's easy. And that might be the whole point. It could be that the people and the government is are trying to make Canada look attractive for business by not enforcing those laws. By cutting taxes to the point where we're in a, a constant deficit. But it's also not new. At a time when our when our um, our tax levels were much higher, they were also not enforcing crap back then. My grandfather, he talks often about, you know, being a young apprentice, electro a young electrical apprentice, and doing stuff that would be extremely illegal nowadays, like pouring toxic chemicals with any kind of protection into transformers because the transformer came dry then you had to put the stuff inside of it he has a shard of asbestos a visible shard of asbestos on his x-ray at the bottom of his lungs Thalidomide. Go look up thalidomide. We were pretty much the last civilized nation, civilized nation in the world to outlaw thalidomide. That's the thing that causes babies to be born with no arms and no legs and hydroencephalitis. And we were one of the last nations on the planet after the United States. The United States banned it before we did. Isn't that crazy? 
Canada. We're supposed to be one of the cleanest nations. And we are. Littering doesn't really occur here. It's sort of oddly beautiful that it doesn't occur here. I, mean, I can't really explain why, but we have exceptionally clean streets. Even in the middle of nowhere, like out where I live, there's constant dog poop everywhere because no one scoops. But you don't see drink cans on the, on the ground or cigarette butts. Sometimes you see the occasional cigarette butts, but not like layers of them everywhere. Um, I lived in this small town for the past 10 years. I have never seen a street sweeper come by. You know, one of those uh, machines that turn around. And yet, the streets are fairly clean. They're, they're disrepaired to all hell, but there's no trash. I have gone to Toronto several times. Now, I don't go to Toronto often. I haven't been to very many places, but very clean there too. And in Ottawa, again, very clean. And yet we are constantly amending um, old environmental laws or uh, giving special variances. That's a, that's a big thing. I'm, I'm not 100% positive, but I'm pretty sure that the oil sands, the tar sands, has a variance to break the law. And it's not a matter of, you know, corporations can fight it and get away with it. No, everybody in the whole chain. It's not like the U.S. The U.S., you know, the big guys get away with stuff, but the but the little guys have to swallow it. No, in Canada, that's 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 not it. There is a law on the books right now that says that you that if you are that you can't burn waste oil for heat. That's that's a crime to do that, but it's not enforced, and a lot of oil chains places are still burning for heat. And there's also grandfather clause crap in there. Um, one thing in Ontario, pits, you know, uh, oil change pits, uh, maintenance pits, like for to fixing cars and stuff like that, those are also illegal. But if you've already if you already have them on your property, you don't need to fix it. If you have um, an extension on your house that's in clear violation, that it, but it's been there so long that nobody can remember when it was put on, you're grandfathered in. Even if it's dangerous, you're grandfathered in. If you have a kitchen without an exhaust fan, and trust me, those exhaust fans are necessary. I'm actually afraid of cooking. I live in a place without an exhaust fan above a stove, and I'm afraid of cooking because the the... The, the slightest amount of smoke that comes up like if you're trying to if you're trying to to brown a piece of meat the fire alarm will go off and for and because it's really easy to interconnect all the fire alarms like it it costs like five hundred dollars to do it in a building oh, the fire alarm and the entire building goes off everybody's fire alarm goes off it's fucking nuts I barely cook now I set it off, I think, three times or something like that. And I've been, I've been, I've opened the door yelling, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm affecting everybody's lives. I'm making everybody's lives worse. Because I needed to cook. And there is, you can't, because of the way the laws are written, you can't do a stopgap measure. At my grandmother's house, she had basically a hole in the wall with a really powerful fan. It wasn't a fume hood, it just sucked it straight through. You couldn't do that here. Because as soon as they as soon as they tried doing that, that that would be a new installation, and then they would be hit without having a proper fume hood. So no stopgap measures. The law says that the shitty, non-existent, 
against regulation, installation, thing, whatever. Keeping that in place is more legal than something halfway. And you can ask 100, 100 Canadians. And most Canadians will say that Canadians are law-abiding. But I guarantee you, every one of those Canadians will have broken a law. And not something super minor. I mean something that could eventually or did become dangerous. And I'm not talking about driving... Uh, uh, talking on your cell phone while driving, although that is dangerous. I mean incorrectly installing a major appliance. You can do the work yourself when you um, renovate your house, but you still need a permit and it still needs to be inspected to make sure that it's done right. That That it, it doesn't stop being a requirement because you're the owner and you can do it yourself. You still have to do that. You still have to have it inspected. But no one has it has it inspected. That's that's a serious that's a serious law. Most Canadians have broken. And it could eventually set their house on fire. And that's not a that's that's not a, a, a weak claim. That's not that's not just me spouting it off. There are uh, um, fires in Canada due to old or shoddy wiring is exceptionally common. Especially for baseboard heaters. Baseboard heaters are the devil. Because they draw so much power. People use the wrong size wire, it melts, the insulation around the wire melts, um, neutral, ground, return, whatever, touches one another, it sparks, it gets even hotter, the breaker doesn't, uh, doesn't blow properly, or because the breaker has blown so many times in the past, because it is getting old, it is getting weak, it is causing uh, functionality problems. They've replaced the proper breaker with something four or five times the ampage rating. That is super common. Normal house wiring is not supposed to carry 40 amps. But they don't Canadians, I don't know about other places, but Canadians don't seem to think those are laws. I don't think they think they're suggestions either. I think in their minds they see a distinction between regulation, policy, or policy. Policy would be the low one, then regulation, then laws. Most Canadians were okay with wearing a mask and getting um, vaccinated. That didn't seem to be a huge deal breaker for them. But the mentality was there. In the United States, they recognized it as a law, even if they saw it as unjust. In Canada, those regulations and those policies that were put in place. I think they just saw it as being considerate to your fellow man. And nobody got a fine. There's a few people that got fines. There's, there's one, well, not one, but one group that I know of they, they're eight people, they all live in the same house. 
and they, they went somewhere walking together and because they were in a group over five, even though they all lived together, they got fined. And of course they all paid it. They could have fought it because they were um, following the law because it's a group of five or people you lived with or something. I don't remember what the exact wording was. But generally speaking, no one was fined. If someone went into a store without a mask on, nobody would go up to them or say anything. They'd just get a lot of dirty looks. Which is usually enough to get people to put masks on. I forgot my mask once. Not on purpose. I walked into the store. I had my mask around my neck. And I guess I was in the store for two minutes. And then there was an announcement over the, over the PA saying, We'd like to remind you to wear masks and stuff like that. No one told me to put it on. I just suddenly realized that I hadn't pulled it up over my face and I did it immediately and then like 10 seconds later the announcement came on. Not that I expect somebody to jump on me and say and find me but if I got disruptive I would I would hope somebody would do something. There's also a lot of quote-unquote accidental fires on job sites, especially when demolition occurs. And usually it's waste that has to, has to be thrown out, but it can't be in like regular garbage. It has to be, you know, brought to the special contamination dump. For some reason, they quite often those piles that had been temporary, temporarily put in the backyard so that it can be put in a, put in a, in a skip and then take it away, catch fire. People pour oil down storm drains still, constantly. They flush stuff down the toilet that they're not supposed to flush. And there are actual regulations not to do it. People do it anyways because, well, it's practically unenforceable. But I don't know. I guess that example was kind of nitpicky, but it happens constantly. I was an apprentice plumber illegally working as an apprentice plumber alone on a site without a mechanic doing all the work myself when I was a kid The mentality is there. And it's not even a double standard. It's just a lackadaisical attitude. Getting back to the littering, I think people don't litter because you can see it. It disturbs people. But if I put an addition on my house, that only affects me and the person you sell your house to later on. To some extent, I don't think this rant is very coherent. It's just... the convoy didn't... the response to the convoy didn't... Uh, didn't surprise me at all. Canada is certainly not lawless, but we're a country that chooses which laws we're going to enforce. Did you know 
that um, the law against abortion is still on our books. It's just not enforced. We don't repeal. I'm not sure if we even have... I, I, I took a half a year law, and I can't believe I'm, I'm saying that. I don't know if we have a, a mechanism to repeal laws, but I don't think we do. We may not. And so often things just fall out of fashion. And while we might stand here and sit here and think, well, the law against abortion was bad. It was wrong. There, there was, there's no justifiable reason why um, it should be enforced. So it's a good thing it's not enforced. And the marijuana laws, it's a good thing that it's been decriminalized. Because alcohol is much worse than weed. But what about the environmental laws? Is it a good thing that we're not recognizing those laws? That we're not enforcing them? We are not the cleanest country in the world. And all of those numbers about pollutants that we're sending up in the air, all of that stuff is self-reported. We are putting so much crap into the atmosphere because of not the big businesses, but the little businesses that aren't that are theoretically regulated, but not being regulated. I have worked for places that had um, health and safety violations that you wouldn't believe. No one ever complained, including me. I, I, I worked there my, my, my entire time that I was there. I would complain to, you know, my boss about it. But I wouldn't file a complaint. I was working on a job site alone, without a mechanic, unsupervised, at a fucking school, building a school. And you might say, oh, you didn't complain about it because you were involved. No, I didn't complain about other other people doing it either. I'm, I'm part of the problem here. And there's no solution. Usually I like to have a solution. Or a direction in the rant. Or something. But this time there just isn't. Canadians shouldn't be proud of our country. There's nothing to be proud of. I don't think we're in the top 10 of anything. Of education, of standard of living, of the happiness in index. Nothing. We are not special in any way. And we fall below on so many counts. Yet we're delusional. I was delusional. I thought that Canada was this environmental bastion that was fighting pollution drifting over our border. We're not. Per capita, I think we're putting more in the air than the United States is. Because we also have um, fuel expenditures in the winter. Per capita, we spend much more on heating costs. And that just goes up and up and up the flue, up into the air. We had plans to, to build more nuclear power plants, and our plants are the, some of the safest in the world. I think they are the safest in the world. They're based on the original design. They're not the original design. They've been evolved quite a bit, but separate um, horizontal fuel channels where water is constantly being put through. Individual loading and unloading. And I think if the water ever stopped, um, 
an external pump can be brought in to hook up and it can be dumped into the holding tanks but we didn't build more because we have a large fossil fuel industry that fought against it and successfully fought against it I was shocked out of my mind when I found out that as little as a few years ago we still had a full coal-fired power plant here in Canada here in Ontario and only closed in like 2015 or something like that in Alberta there are tailing ponds just scooped out sections of earth of bowls full of the most vile crap you can imagine leaking into rivers in Alberta they're not getting fined they're not being forced to clean it up nothing in Ontario um, on the, uh, the, the the banks of the Great Lakes um, there are these mounds I think it's it's coke fuel coke not cocaine coke or something of that nature that it's it's piled up and it's like 200 meters from a from an elementary school and the instances of cancer in the community are like 16 times higher than nation the national average when you go looking and I'm gonna get to that in a minute going looking if you go looking you can find so much wrong here now speaking of going looking again I was I was renting a place and I was having a lot of disputes with the landlord and the um, uh, the uh, the municipality so I quote unquote fixed a smoke machine in my bathroom with the door closed and the fan on basically to prove that they had hooked up the the fans illegally that my fan was exhausting into uh, my neighbor's apartment and that both the bathroom fan and the kitchen fan were hooked up together so basically for the movement of air to the movement of air wouldn't get outside first it would be dumped into his exhaust would be dumped into my apartment and my apartment my apartment's exhaust would be d dumped into his apartment and to prove that I use this smoke machine and the um, city planner was like why would you do that well if everything was hooked up properly it wouldn't have been a problem and that's the attitude that's the attitude that seems to be to be pervasive don't go looking for problems it's not even a ain't if it ain't broke don't fix it is if you don't know it's not broke don't find out if it's broken that's I think that should be the motto of Canada I think that will be the conclusion of this rant <coughs> that Canada is a country of don't go looking for problems if it's out of sight it's out of mind in Ottawa downtown Ottawa the cops got to go home they didn't have to sit there listening to the honking they don't have to stand face to face with people not wearing masks breathing on them constantly I live in a good house I don't but I mean theoretical I live in a good house if my neighbor um, does some renovations without a, without a permit well that's not that important 
until it catches on fire and burns down the neighborhood. Yeah. I guess that's what we are. The nation of don't go looking for problems. Status quo. The delusional bliss that Even though we're in the middle of an apocalypse, the road is flat and just keeps going. Oh, we also have failing infrastructure because of all those reasons. We have bridges falling down all over the place. And if you lived in Ottawa, Carlingwood or Carling Avenue, that's because nobody uh, wanted to fix crap. If it ain't broke, it, 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 don't go looking for problems. Yeah, Carling Avenue. I think it was voted top 10 of the uh, country's worst roads. And our power grid is like constantly near overload all the time. And Bell Canada is, is not really, you know, um, continuing to build out its network. It's refusing to uh, upgrade rural areas. Yeah. That stuff happens here, too. Oh, and cops not investigating break-ins. That's that's a huge thing. You, you live in a, in, a, in a supposedly protected apartment building, underground parking, uh, key entry on, on all sides, cameras looking in, uh, at the uh, at the entrances, and uh, twenty cars will get broken into. The cops won't do anything. Won't dust for prints. Won't ask questions. Won't really take any statements because it's not important enough. So, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to become a petty theft in Canada. It's probably going to be a fairly easy life for you. Probably not going to see too many consequences. It's just the truth. And it has nothing to do with the penalties not being tough enough. It's a lack of enforcement. The reason you can be a thief in Canada and be fairly certain you're not going to uh, face too many consequences is because... Nobody's looking. Seriously, nobody's looking. Don't do this. Absolutely do not do this. I am absolutely not advocating for breaking and entering. But break and enter into your, into your neighbor's house when they're away, when you know that they're away. Don't take anything either. Just make it look like you've taken something. Mess things up. Make it look obvious that, you've, that somebody has entered their their apartment or their house the cops will come hang around and listen to them nothing will be done very basic statements will be taken and then they'll leave that's the society we are in non-enforcement don't go looking for problems seriously don't do that don't be a dick Really. And it's and the reason it won't be investigated isn't because you're not important. It isn't because rich people get more attention. It's just that rich people collect more evidence. They have more cameras pointing in places. They can if 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 a porch pirate steals um your Amazon delivery and you have cameras that clearly see their face and clearly see their license plate number because it takes the cops no effort to look up that plate number to find out who that is and just go 
look to see if that if the if the person's face matches who's in the video they'll investigate that but they won't do anything hard they won't go looking for evidence i'm i'm really stressing the point don't go looking for problems is our country's motto it it really is if you're walmart you have seven million cameras looking at somebody you you have the person caught red-handed with multiple witnesses the cops can't ignore that but if they don't have a suspect they're putting the same amount of effort in and again it's not a deterrence problem it's an enforcement problem they can actually investigate that stuff they can actually collect evidence dust for prints look for the for the fenced items but they don't because that's who we are seriously 23 and me can offer you a full DNA sequencing that you can download and keep for yourself have it on a file take it to other websites find out precisely what kind of genetic diseases you have but the cops can't look for DNA samples in a break and entering they can't they can't comb for evidence they just take your statement and they go well we'll let you know if we hear anything Motherfucker, you're not going to hear anything because you're not listening.